Welcome to another dimension. A dimension of insight. A dimension of understanding. You are entering a place where reality collides with truth. There are no limits. There are no boundaries. This is all planet radio. Welcome to Off Planet Radio. I'm Randy Moggins. It seems like the times right now call for us to kind of listen to what I guess the Spirit is saying to us. I've been kind of down a path for a number of years, and I've talked about it on these shows from time to time, but I haven't really pursued the subject matter a whole lot. But we're going to talk about the Archons. Um, I have a sense right now that a lot of things are being unveiled as we go into this really deep, dark time that we're living in in the world. And the more understanding we get about the subject matter, the more effective we're going to be in terms of being able to stand up and begin to combat what is basically the enemies of mankind. I want to read a quote. Long ago, the native sorcerer shamans of Mexico discovered that we have a companion for life. We have a predator that came from the depths of the cosmos and took over the rule of our lives. Human beings are its prisoners. The predator is our lord and master. It has rendered us docile, helpless. If we want to protest, it suppresses our protest. If we want to act independently, it demands that we don't do so. And that quote comes from a book called The Active Side of Infinity by Carlos Castaneda, and it frames the conversation that we're about to have with our guest today, who has actively been researching and experiencing the effects and the presence of these beings, both light and dark, interacting with humanity. We welcome Robert Stanley. His website is unicusmagazine.com. And Robert, welcome to Off Planet Radio. Hey, thanks for having me, Randy. It's good to, good to have you on. Um, Several weeks ago, we got in contact with each other. I connected with you specifically to discuss the subject of what we call the Archons. Uh, for listeners who don't know who you are, maybe you can give us a little bit of the background. You're a UFO investigator as well, having covered um, the uh, flyovers of UFOs over Washington, D.C. So we'll kind of open up, frame this a little bit with um your, your background and how you got into this uh, particular subject. Okay. Well, I, it wasn't like I was looking for it, honestly. Um, I really don't consider myself a UFO investigator. I'm more of a journalist in general. Um, and, um, you know, the reason I started investigating UFOs at all was because they were investigating me. <laughs> and that's that's yeah i mean that's yeah. the honest truth yeah. okay well i think that's how we all stumble into this in some circuitous I, way i guess i guess i don't know i can't speak for everyone um but i mean for myself it started out in malibu and of course that seems to be now on everybody's radar but uh at the time when i was living there back 60s 70s and 80s um people were having a lot of weird close encounters and i was one of them uh oftentimes i was not alone um I do have some pictures of that, and I, you know, uh, I was just very curious about who these people were, why they were so covert in the way that they were um, interacting with people, uh, like mm -hmm. at an arm's length, you know. Yeah. And and uh, but I guess we should really start at the beginning. Obviously, is um, uh, <laughs> the reason that things really got interesting for me when I was twenty five years old. Uh, in 1985, yes, I was 25 years old. It was the fall equinox, September 21st, 1985, when I first encountered or became aware of the Archons. And um, that was while I was working security at a beach in Malibu and uh, very prestigious. I mean, you know, all the, the mucky muck people, the elite of Hollywood lived there and um I just, you know, it was just a job for me, but it was it was intriguing, um, to say the least. Anyway, uh, I met a boy there who was uh, possessed by these things, and um, uh, <laughs> he 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 uh, he he damn near died. I mean, he, he you know, 
I don't know this for a fact, but it's it's I can say with some degree of certainty that if I hadn't intervened, I I'm pretty sure he would have bled to death. And it was just one of those weird moments. Okay. Anyway, as I was doing that for these, this family, um, and by the way, it wasn't part of my job. It was just an instinct. It was a reflex. I just, I couldn't, I don't know. I didn't. Can you give me a little bit more of the picture of what was happening? Yeah. Okay. I've talked about this so many times. Okay. Let me, let's, here's how, here's how this goes. All right. If you really want the whole story, I'd be fair to people who've never heard this before. It was a absolutely gorgeous day at the beach and um it wasn't too crowded for me because actually i did crowd control that's what i was doing there um for the homeowners they really didn't want people uh sitting on their private property and there was legal issues it, it, it really it, if they didn't maintain their property at some point the whole beach could have been considered a public easement right and so i was that's what i was doing at the time though i i really uh, actually i just, I had just got back from surfing uh, because I had some downtime, and th- that happened infrequently, and it was, it was always wonderful. So I, I got out of the water, and I put the surfboard back at the house uh, near where I was stationed as a security guard. And uh, I was walking away from the house, and I, there was a, a young boy. I think he was around 9 or 10, and he was sitting there playing in the sand by himself, and he he didn't look very happy is the first thing I noticed about him. And then I, 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 I looked at him and I said, hey, how you doing? And he he didn't look at me. And um, he kind of mumbled something like, yeah, whatever. I, I, he just wasn't in the seem happy. And then I realized, I looked at his, a little closer, I could see there was a big scar on his forehead. And um, I, I didn't want to bother him. It was none of my business. But as I walked away from him, I'm thinking, man, however he got that big scar on his forehead, that must have hurt. Maybe he's like, you know, suffering. Yeah. He could have a, he could have like head trauma or something from that scar. And, but I didn't think anything of it. So I walked over very nearby, walked, you know, a couple doors down, sat down, I'm starting to warm up because the water is pretty cold out in Malibu, actually, uh, even in the summertime. Um, so I was, I was starting to warm up and I was really feeling very good. I mean, it was <laughs> the juxtaposition. The reason I'm telling you this is because it was so, it was so stark that I had, I had this feeling just before all hell literally break loose uh, around me. I had a feeling of how uh, uh, just how good it felt to be alive at that moment in that place. Mm -hmm. And, and as I was sitting there, there was a, uh, a most unusual sound. And what it was is that boy had gone upstairs to the second floor of the house and he ran across the living room full speed into a sliding glass door and broke it with his face. And um, the sound of that, it was, I don't think it was safety glass because it shattered the whole thing. I mean, it, it shattered in very large pieces. So it had a, like a, a ringing tone to it, like almost like a bell. Right. But it was horrific, too, because at the sound, I don't know, big sheets of glass, they have a certain sound to them. Anyway, um, I, t- I turned my head. It was just a reflex. I turned my head towards that sound, and I saw the boy raise his hands to his face, and then there was a shadowy figure of a man came up behind him and clutched him up, and that all happened in just like, you know, a second, not even a second. It just, it was really, it, but the other thing I remember really clearly, Randy, was that the time slowed down. For some reason, and I had no control over this, when it happened, <laughs> from from my perspective, time mm-hmm, slowed down. Mm-hmm. Time compression. Yeah. I, I I guess this is fairly common in a traumatic yep. events. Yes. But like I said, at that point, I didn't know what was going on. I was just reacting. And 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 as soon as I saw that happening, I found myself. I just I got I jumped out of my chair and and sprinted to the house as fast as I could. Like I said, it wasn't far away, and I was actually in very good shape at that time because I used to run on the beach and and, and surf. So I um, <laughs> I was in the house in no time, and I opened the door. I didn't even knock. I just opened the door as fast as I could, and I I yelled security security, and nobody answered. I ran up the stairs, and and there was the grandmother. She was standing there, as white as a sheet. And and there's blood and glass everywhere, and I'm thinking, okay, so where's the kid? And but then I, I said to her, has anybody called uh, the paramedics? 
and she didn't respond to me. So I went over and um, uh, found the phone because I knew the people that owned the property. These people were just, I don't know, renting or friends, I, whatever. Um, uh, and I and I called um, – I forget if I called ambulance. What was it? Whatever it was, I got I, t I got somebody on the phone. I said, "There's somebody's bleeding to death. You got to send the paramedics right now." And so they did. And you know, I it, moment, you know, whatever minutes later, they were they showed up and and began the um, treating him in the vehicle on the way to the hospital. Because you got to understand, Malibu doesn't have any hospitals. It's weird like that. There's no cemeteries, no hospitals. It's just kind of. And it's also very isolated. A lot of times when people get into life-threatening situations, they are medevaced out by helicopter. Right, right. In, in this case, it didn't happen like that for whatever reason. So I don't know how far he had to drive to get. But at least I know when they showed up, they immediately – because, oh, uh, the grandmother – I started talking to the grandmother. She says uh, – uh, she told me that the her husband, the grandfather, was actually in – had the boy in the bedroom in the back, and he was holding a towel over his face. Well, I can understand why he would do that, but I mean, that would not have saved his life. I mean, it right, may have prolonged right. a little bit, but um, I don't know if you've ever cut your cut your scalp. Yes. Okay. It, you know, it it bleeds really. Profusely. Yeah, I actually put my face through a, a, a windshield in a car accident. Oh, time. Jesus. Yeah, okay, so. so you know this <laughs> in intimately. All yeah. right. So anyway, um, um, I, I okay, so. I realized that she was still in a state of shock and there was glass everywhere. So I, st I, again, I just sort of helped myself to some tools and I started cleaning up. And as I was doing that, um, I, I was sort of trying to talk to her cause I could see how she freaked out she was. And, and I, um, I said at some point I said, excuse me. Um, uh, I, it's not my, none of my business, but I noticed he had a, already had a scar in his forehead. And she said, yeah, um, Last year, he jumped out of his father's pickup truck, the bed of the pickup truck. This is while I was parked. He was playing with the cat in the back of the pickup truck, and he jumped out. The cat jumped out. Then he jumped out after the cat and hit his face. face for, he jumped out head first like Superman, oh. went <clears throat> face first into a trailer hitch and busted his forehead. Literally, I mean, oh. it, was, it was a huge scar. I, like I said, I could, I figured, you know, you don't get that's not like a scratch. That that was bad, and um, uh, okay, well, that was bad. But she then she says to me, I, I didn't even ask her this. She says, it's a good thing the door was shut. Otherwise, that he he it, this could have been a lot worse. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, it, he. <sighs> <laughs> he, she said, I think he was going to jump over the railing uh, uh, head first, like he did out of the pickup truck. And she says, um, she says, for some reason, I think he thinks he can fly. And at that moment, <clears throat> I was in a very weird state of mind. Like I said, everything had kind of, kind of gone back to normal. After I ran over there, things, that was the other thing. It slowed down and then it sort of sped up as I ran. I don't know. I don't know what was going on. Mm -hmm. What that mm -hmm. mechanism is in us, but it's very, very weird well, feeling. We're creating our own time states. That's Something that's like what that. I believe. Yeah. Yeah, but it was very brief, but it was extremely sure. dramatic at the way it happened. Anyway, I didn't have any control of that, but I'm in the house, I'm talking to her, cleaning up this mess, and she tells me that, and I got the weirdest like goosebumps on my arm. Because at that moment, I had a realization, and I don't know where it came from, that there was a voice telling him that he could fly. And um, and when I had that thought, I, again, this was completely instinctual. I looked up, and I could see these things. I, I believe this was with my third eye. I, I mean, I don't really think I saw it with my regular vision, but I, somehow I managed to see these things that were in the air at the top of the ceiling, they, um, they, the only thing I could say that they kind of resembled was ticks because that's at the time, you know, growing up in Malibu, um, there's a lot of ticks out right, there. Right, right, yeah. So they kind of, I mean, so again, instinctually, I knew they were like parasites. I didn't realize that those things were the, are even capable of, of manipulating that boy and his grandparents in that fashion. At the time, I had no idea. Uh, however, once I saw them, 
um, and I had that awareness, and and I had broken up their feeding frenzy. Mm-hmm. They they started attacking me. Okay, at, and I they I only saw them for a brief brief moment, but it was enough for me to to like really really wonder what in the hell was going on. Um, as if things weren't weird enough. I mean, it just it went from strange to stranger in a very quick moment. I mean, it, I tell people it was like being thrown in the deep end of the demon pool. I, I just it was sink or swim, honestly. So, um, uh, I didn't stay very long there. Obviously, I didn't. You know, my job was done there. Like I said, that really wasn't my job. But um, I uh, walked out of there, and I felt I felt really weird. I felt like um, obviously the adrenaline had. I, there's a lot of adrenaline got through my body, but there was these, these things I couldn't get them out of my mind, and I felt like, to me, that they were um, attacking my solar plexus, and it was just bizarre. I mean, it's like you know when you're really stressed out, sometimes you get a knot in your stomach. Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah. Yeah, ex- yep. except there was I could, as far as I could tell, I mean, there was no reason for me to be that stressed out and um or feeling like that other than the fact that you know i was right in the middle of this bizarre event and um the thing is you know looking back on it uh (laughs) i i i know quite a few people who have committed suicide in malibu i mean these are people i grew up with okay and um and so like i said in hindsight a lot of things make sense at the time it didn't make any sense at all. So what I did was after work, I went over to my next door neighbor's house. He was a, somewhat of a mentor for me. And um, he was a uh, uh, paraplegic guy. Mm-hmm. And he'd actually been quadriplegic for a while. And he, got in, he was in a terrible car accident. And the thing about him is he, he told me he had, <laughs> he had a spirit body he could go walking around in. And I fully believed him because I'd seen him in my dream. I, I remember almost every time I saw him in my dreams, it freaked me out because he'd be walking, you know. And he told me, he says, ah, don't tell anybody. That's just our secret, you know. It's like uh, we all have a spirit body, you know. And I'm like, really? Okay, whatever. So I told him what happened <clears throat> down at the beach and how it was – and I, I didn't know what to do. And he said, well, tonight's the equinox. He says, go up to the mountain and uh, and uh, walk, watch the sunset and – um, uh, you'll have a vision. I was like, okay, yeah, f- would that, st- Hey, it's at that point, anything seemed better than just sitting around. Cause I didn't, I felt so uncomfortable. And, uh, um, so I did, I went up there and, uh, I wasn't planning on spending the night, but I actually spent the entire night up there by myself um with no food or water and uh, so i rode my motorcycle to this spot i don't know i just it was just like i said i was running on instinct and uh, i got there well before sunset and it was one of those nights it does this doesn't happen very often but the full moon was coming up as the sun was setting and i literally was sitting in the middle between the two of these um astronomical bodies which was a very interesting feeling and uh um, so I began trying different things, you know, and um, including, you know, uh, I was it, all this was so spontaneous. I actually tilted my head back. I could see out of one eye, I could see the sun, and the other eye, I could see the moon. That was mm. a weird feeling. Um, kind of hard to do, but I, I, I managed to do that. And I, and I, again, I, I followed my mentor's instructions. I did watch the sun as it was melting into the sea. It's, it's a safe time to do that if you really want to stare into the sun, uh, trying to connect with that energy through right. your, um, right? Uh, because if you look at somebody doing that, it's really kind of weird, but if you look at somebody who's doing that, uh, their eyes, th- their pupils are actually the color of the sun. It's, it's kind of a weird thing. But Interesting. Anyway, I, I've, I've, that was not an observation I've ever made. Well, because normally you wouldn't be standing in front right. of it, but I I, rec- I realized it later that that's what my eyes must have looked like because I was wide open and staring into the sun. But anyway, uh, there, it has a correlation because I started to um, sit on the ground and uh, meditate as though my life depended on it because I was still under attack by these things. I could just feel them. And... Um, I mean, I've been stung by jellyfish and bees and ticks and, you know, you name it, mosquitoes. Nothing felt like what these things were doing to me. 
And um, there was clearly a, more than one of them. There was a swarm of them. And um, so as it got darker, I started to uh, – I decided I would try a technique in Kriya Yoga where you begin chanting Om. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I was doing it in such a way that I pushed my tongue up against the uh, roof of my mouth as I was saying it. Right. And I was sitting, you know, firmly on the ground and I and I could feel the energy going through from the earth through my spine. And um uh as I was saying this resonant Om, you know, over and over again. Just, I mean, really, just putting some effort into that. I could feel my head. I could literally feel a resonant energy going out, like overtones coming out the top right, of my yeah, skull. Yeah, I've experienced Which, this before too. Yeah, it's it, it was really, like I said, I didn't plan this out. It just was, <laughs> you know, it just it was happening. And I, I mean, yes, I could have not done it, but it was like I was just trying things. So, and um, I realized that. <laughs> sort of like a message in a bottle that that this beam or yeah this this frequency that I was broadcasting could be picked up um by something or someone further out there because it was getting dark and I could see the milky way starting to form uh or I should say an arm of you know where we're at in the galaxy and um so I figured you know uh I will broadcast on this frequency sort of like we're doing now and the only thing that i was broadcasting was one thought was love because what i had experienced with that boy and his grandparents to me that was the utter opposite of love creativity and etc uh that was just evil you know you don't do something like that to anybody well i mean why would you um so uh i did that i don't know i i don't really usually don't wear a watch and um I'm not sure exactly what time it was, but I know that the moon was, let's just say if it was the sun, it would have been a little past midday, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, as far as with the position of the moon. And I was starting to get pretty tired. And so I laid down on the, uh, there were some cement structures there that were left over from uh, an old Nike installation they had, uh, because this is, this was very near to Point Magoo Naval Base. And, um, back in the day when they were using all the Nike uh, surface-to-air missiles, you know, anti-missile defense. Yeah, Yeah, I was laying on on these ruins um, from the military on the cement, and um, (laughs) I laid down on cement, and I'm not kidding. In a matter of moments, I I felt – it felt like I was floating, and I didn't resist it at all. I just floated right out of my body, or at least some part of me disconnected from my body. And I floated into uh, a dimension of light, which a lot of people out of body, if if you read any of the out of body experiences or near death experiences, they're all very similar in that regard. Uh, When you really disconnect, you you know, you end up in typically, you know, you end up in this other dimension. So uh, I wasn't there for more than a felt like just a few moments. And you got to understand, I wasn't asleep. I I really need to stress this, that I was not asleep. And I certainly was not dreaming because I wasn't even asleep yet. Uh, But I was fully aware of what was happening to me. And as I was in the light, I realized I was safe. So I guess you could say mission accomplished there. Mm -hmm. Um, But then I saw something moving and it was coming towards me, which of course that got all my attention. And um, as it got closer, I realized it was actually a person but I, I, not, I wasn't expecting this. Again, everything about this experience is just utterly shocking. And uh, still, to this day, it, it floors me. Um, the person that came up to me looked like Christ. It, I'm not saying it was. In fact, he didn't even say he was. I, when I looked at him, uh, he had long hair and a beard and some sort of robe. And, but his eyes were glowing. He was glowing brighter than the light we were in, and his eyes were – there was a light coming out of his eyes. Mm-hmm. And and I thought to myself, whoa, who is that? And I believe he said to me, I am the father. He either said, I, I am the father, or he might have said, I am your father. I, it's, it's hard for me to remember because I was so shocked, not only by his appearance, but the fact that, you know, what do you mean? You're the father of father of What? I mean, I was 25 at the time. Yes, I'd studied some religious stuff material, but I'm not 
I'm not devoutly religious. I just, mm-hmm. it, it just, it just, this to me, it really didn't make a lot of sense to me. And I guess my state of confusion, um, th- he thought that was funny. And uh, not in a sinister way at all, but he started laughing. And that's the last thing. I mean, the next thing I know, I'm sitting bolt upright and I'm, I'm like going, what in the heck was that all about? I, I guess I got my vision, right? You know, but then I, the, the next shocking thing for me was I realized I looked and, and now the moon was setting on the horizon. And I thought, well, wait a second. Oh, wow. I, yeah. Did I fall asleep? I couldn't have been asleep. I wasn't asleep. I just laid down and then this and then now I'm awake. Where, what happened? I, I mean, that didn't make any sense. I've never had experience like that. Um, some people have tried to say it was missing time or whatever. I don't think so. I think I, in fact, I know I went somewhere because people saw me. That's the, this thing is so bizarre, man. I can't, like I said, I almost hesitate to tell people this because it just doesn't sound like I'm sane when I tell it, but I'm, this is what happened. Okay. So I, I'm standing there. Now I'm standing there talking to myself wondering what happened i couldn't i couldn't lay back down now because i'm thinking this is not right this is crazy i mean i was but i also knew i wasn't being attacked anymore which okay i was grateful for that but now i'm completely confused i'm like who was that guy and how come i can't remember where i've been for the past or what happened i knew something had happened in in all those hours that i was out of my body uh it was a complete blank and i'm like so i'm i'm literally walking around in circles going this is crazy this is nuts i don't get this at all and so i waited for the the sun to rise and remember what i told you when i got there the sun was setting the moon was rising right well now the opposite thing was happening and i here i am still in the middle of it okay and you know i would not have been up there for that event the that that energy exchange like that unless i had been attacked I would have not been meditating like that on on a mountain by myself all night long until I literally left my body uh, unless I'd been attacked. So that was an unattended con- I don't think that these things, when they started attacking me, I don't think that was their goal, okay? But that was what that was the consequence of it all. Uh, once the, the sun had come up sufficiently, I felt safe enough to ride back down because I was still pretty tired. And I was really shook up, too. I mean, I was so utterly perplexed by all of this stuff um, uh, <laughs> that I, I – I, so what I, I got on my motorcycle, and I, I ride back down to the beach. And um, I'm sitting there trying to figure this out, and I had this feeling like I better go check on – what happened to this boy because last time I saw him he was he was in terrible shape I mean for all I know he could have died on the way to the hospital I I just didn't not that again it's not really not my business but I just had this really really strong uh sense that I needed to do that okay so um I walked over to the house I knocked on the door again no answer so I just quietly opened the door and I said hello is anybody here and and then I saw the grandparents came to the top of the stairs, and I said, hi, you know, um, I just wanted to see if you, is your grandson okay. And they said, yeah, um, he's going to live. He lost a lot of blood. And they said he had to have over 300 stitches in his face. Oh. I'm like, oh. Jesus. I, and, and, and then, and then, as it, you know, this, it, it just, it doesn't, hmm. Uh, I'm hearing myself saying this, and I can't even believe it. I said, I know this is going to sound strange, but unless you heal the scars on his soul. I don't know. I said, you can heal the scars on his face, but unless you heal the scars on his soul, this will happen again. And Mm -hmm. I I was like, oh, my God, what did I just say? And then I just, I didn't even, I, I just, I just walked out of there going, oh, God, I'm going to get fired they're going to think I flipped my lid. Um, and honestly, I felt like I was going nuts. I really did. I thought I was going a little crazy. Um, well, do you and, not think that that was actually what you were supposed to do? That was the download that you got? <laughs> I, I kind of, okay, I can't prove it, but I have a feeling I must have checked in on him when I was in that other state mm. of being. 
Uh, I can't, I, I don't have, again, I, I, that's been blocked. And I found that other people who have near death experiences describe the same thing where they, they see things in vivid detail, but other things are, they're literally told, right. look, we're going to have to, sorry, but you can't have a clear memory when you go back because this would just be harmful to you. Um, you know, uh, again, a lot of, a lot of research had to go into understanding this. Uh, it was, it's been like a lifelong quest actually. Um, but so, Okay. I was feeling very weird when I left that house, and I had no intention of going back there uh, for that reason. I go over to my where I was stationed, and I'm sitting there trying to figure things out. And this girl comes up to me. She was a friend of my girlfriend at the time. She was very excited. She says, Robert, I saw you in my dreams last night. And I'm like, okay, you know, what so? And yeah. she says, you, you, you taught me how to fly. I'm like, I did. And she says, yeah, you came into my bedroom and you took me up to the mountains. And I'm like, what? You know, what? Yeah, you took me up to the mountains and you taught me how to fly. Really? Okay. And she says, yeah. And you were, we were up there for a while and you were getting frustrated with me because I just wasn't getting it. So you put me in a shopping cart and started pushing me back down the hill. And then she says, I got, I didn't like that. So I jumped out and then suddenly I found myself flying. And she says, you, you, you flew right next to me and, and you, you made sure that I got back home. She says, it was kind of like Peter Pan. I'm like, really? Yeah. That's what I was thinking when you were painting that picture. It's crazy though. It did if it had just stopped there, I would have, I would have like, uh, oh, okay, because I hadn't told her anything, and and I wasn't gonna tell anybody anything, but she was telling me, uh, you know, specifically, we went up to the mountains last night. I'm like, wow, that's a okay, that's a pretty weird coincidence if she just got that just out of the blue, because she wasn't. I mean, look, this person, nice lady, but she was like not into this stuff at all. She was a typical valley girl that liked to smoke cigarettes and drink alcohol and drive cars and go to the mall. I mean, it was just like, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, this was not on her radar. And for her, to, she actually said to me, she says, I think this has something to do with spirituality. I read about this in my psych class once. And I'm looking at her going, this, oh, God, this is just getting crazier by the minute. So um, I didn't tell her what happened because how could I? You know, I, I didn't even understand what was happening. But after I got off work, that that day um, later, I went home and it, the phone's ringing and in, I picked it up. It was my grandmother, total opposite person, very spiritual, very spiritual woman. And she, she says, Robbie, I saw you in my dreams last night. I'm like, oh, God, <laughs> I hope I didn't <laughs> take my grandmother flying. I was thinking, oh, Jesus, because I mean, she's barely she could barely walk and let alone I'm going to take her flying to the mountain. So she says, um, you you were standing at the foot of my bed. And you were saying something to me, but for the life of me, I can't remember what it was because she says you had lights all around you like a Christmas tree. She said it was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. I just had to call and tell you that. And I'm like, I, I was so shocked. I'm like, okay, Granny, uh, thanks. I, I, I got to go. I'm tired. <laughs> it's just like this now, now there, if I was drowning in the deep end of a demon pool, that was my life preserver those two women witnessing to me what they had experienced with me in another dimension of being was was just enough to keep me from really going crazy or thinking that I had lost my mind or was mm -hmm. losing my mind, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I, paid, I, I had to pay attention to what was going on. The next thing that happened more or less, was I ended up going back to the mountains hoping that I would somehow meet this being of light and maybe ask him some questions. And what did I find was these ancient ruins or statues, huge megalithic statues up in the mountains there of, of a dormant extinct volcano. And um, the, the shock of my life, though, was when I was there, I recognized this place. I... I I remembered that I had actually dreamed about multiple times when I was a kid. I used to have lucid dreams about going there, and it was still intact at the time, or at least that was the way I saw it in that other state of being. Um, it was it was a um, it was a temple, or more like a university. It was a school. It was a place of learning. Okay, of higher knowledge, mm -hmm. and um, uh, 
But then I kept going back there and I would bring people with me. And especially during the 80s, early 90s, we were having multiple close encounters right there um, at night, usually at night, right above Point Magoo. And now everybody knows about it because of those uh, those Google Earth images of what, you know, some people are calling it a UFO base. I don't really know if it is. I, I don't really think they need a base. I think what they use is portals, wormholes, right, right. stargates, whatever you want to call them. Um, they're coming from another world altogether, but it's not like they have to travel. Right, but it does seem that they have a certain connection to certain geophysical locations, what Absolutely. we might call vortex. So go ahead, yeah, run with that's that. What, yeah. Well, that's what a stargate is. It's a vortex. But the question is, are these natural? Are they artificial? Or there's a combination of both? It's hard to say. But look, I mean, I've come to understand through my research and my own experiences that these portals do exist. Um, they're like windows to other worlds. And I don't mean just peeking in. You literally can go mm -hmm. to and from these other worlds. And whoever set that up, is that's that's amazing. It's truly, truly miraculous, okay? But um, um, the, the sequence of events do seem to me as though they were staged, not for my benefit, but as part of a, a process. An awakening. Uh, it, it, not just for me. Right. There's, it, it, what I found is the, the only reason I actually came out with this as, you know, as publicly as I have in the last few years is because of this common enemy, as you put it uh, earlier, was that the, or they these parasites that the Gnostics called the Archons or Lords, the, the evil overlord of mankind. Um, it, it took me. You know, actually, I was puzzling over this for years. I mean, decades, actually, trying to put it into some kind of context. And it wasn't till like, I think, oh, I finished my second book, uh, Covert Encounters in Washington, D.C., and I was starting to finally realize that these things really are among us. They're not just isolated to certain areas. Like, I was, I was always concerned that maybe they weren't just there in Malibu causing people to commit suicide. Um, but when I was researching, you know, for years, I, I researched uh, the UFO and alien activity in, in Washington, D.C. And in the conclusion of the second book, I had come across the true accounts of what later became known as the book, The Exorcist. Of course, it was made into a movie. Yes. yes. And but that was taken right out of the newspapers. I, I know people like to dismiss it as, oh, no, that was all a big misunderstanding. But uh, it's not. There are way too many incidences of this happening through time in our history and um uh most recently we would call these people schizophrenics uh uh but they, they people do hear the voices sometimes uh, it's more than just hearing the voices but they're very manipulative and yes they're called different things in different cultures at different times but they're always their uh method of operation is always the same it's very covert highly manipulative always destructive in the sense that they are um encouraging people to harm themselves or others and and in the process what i've learned is that they they our bodies actually emit a type of um, a darker energy that these things can feed off of um it's my understanding i could be wrong but this is where i this is really where i've come to a conclusion was that um they're not even from our universe. I believe that they came here, they hitched a ride from some of our ancestors who, who traveled through a wormhole out of this universe into a forbidden zone. And um, when they came back, they had gone insane. They were now no longer peaceful and harmonious with their own kind. They had literally turned against their own kind and they started destroying whole civilizations and whole planets. Uh, and enslaving those that they didn't destroy. And ultimately, that's what they did to this solar system and this planet Earth. Um, and, and it's fairly recent, too. I mean, in, in a galactic scale, or I should say, in the, you know, on the bigger picture of a, the cosmos, this mm -hmm. particular universe, this is all relatively new, my understanding. You know, and here's the other thing, Randy, i got to tell you, not only was I confused about all this, I couldn't figure it out. I tried and tried and tried until I actually mentally made a connection with that being of light, the father, whoever he is or whatever he may really represent. I, I asked him to give me clarity and, um, 
you know, you never know with these things. I know that they can hear our thoughts. That's been just demonstrated to oh, me. Oh, yeah, definitely. Sure. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, and I think that's a natural state that's been denied us over time when, when they turned this, when the, the fallen ones, the archons. Um, let me be more specific because uh, I, I don't want to confuse people. I'm sorry I jump around, but um, uh, these par mental parasites infect the minds of not only humans, but certain extraterrestrials, human and humanoid. Um, not everyone is infected, thank God. But the ones who are infected cause wreak havoc wherever they go, and that causes a lot of issues for people even who are not infected. So um, uh, one of the things was is I started to get messages, guidance from not just the father, but the whole hierarchy of right. uh, the angelic yeah. beings or whatever you want to call them. All right. The, I call, I typically, yeah, I'm I comfortable call with the terminology. It kind of okay. slips and slides, but I think that's a common way to, ex yeah. you know, term yeah. it, Robert. Okay. So, but they are benevolent. I typically just call them benevolent yeah. ones. Yeah. As they started to guide me to certain information, it, it really truly revealed itself finally in the proper context, which was not only that these things had gotten here in, not on their own accord, they can't get out either. They're kind of stuck here, and they're just trying to survive. Not that that, that does not excuse their behavior in any way or shape or form, but I'm just trying to help people understand that these things, um, that's their, like any other life form. Now, know? let me uh, ask you Let me ask you this, and uh, I try not to derail your narrative too much, sorry. but in your sense, are these beings highly intelligent? Are they sentient? What are their capabilities? It appears as though they're non-physical uh, in terms of our own dimensional perception, but at the same time, it also seems that they have some, I guess you would call it, super physical form. Yeah, apparently they can change their shape. They Typically, the pictures that I've sort of dug up uh, mostly were taken by Trevor James Constable back in the 50s, but also NASA got something that looks very, very similar, if not the same. Uh, fairly recently when they were doing the tether experiment. These yeah. things are, and they can change shape as far as I know, but typically they look like an amoeba. Um, uh, obviously, they're not microscopic. And, you know, there's so many different people, I mean, or cultures that have talked about them, but they always seem to have the same uh, um, type of uh, w way of describing them. You know, oh, the these, are, looks, these, are, these are archetypal in, in, in appearance. When I began looking right. at your work, Mm. And going back and doing research into this, I realized that this was a huge archetype in terms of how these things appear and yeah. how they've been uh, depicted, visualized, and presented over what looks like hundreds, if not a few thousand years. Yeah, and I'm thinking probably 10,000 years or yeah. so since they – see, the thing about it, we, we can't really separate them, these parasites, from the beings that they possess or infect. I think infect is probably a more accurate term because they uh, these a lot of times people that are infected don't even realize, uh, you know, the mental, physical, spiritual state that they're in. At least that's the way they act. Um, so when they came here, the fallen ones came here and started, they literally turned this from a paradise planet into a prison planet. Uh, this isn't obviously it's not the only world, but they did that to this world and to all of us, our ancestors, I should say, were enslaved by the Archon hierarchy. And um, the the benevolent ones uh, had never really encountered anything like this before. Like I said, it truly was alien to them. So most of them had to flee for their lives until they could figure out how to deal with it. And but they always promise that they would return and assist mankind here or, you know, not only just to liberate, but to rehabilitate us and put the world back the way it was as a, um, a perfect biosphere right. that, yeah. that sustains life at its fullest potential as opposed to what we're living through right. now. Right, exactly. It's, I mean, yeah. polar opposite. It really you know? is kind of the whole fallen world scenario when you it think is. about it. Um, yeah. Even what little shreds we get inside of <clears throat> like the Bible, yep. which gives us a very what I consider to be a very broken narrative, we mm. get that sense. We get the sense that nature itself is in revolt at this point. <laughs> well, it, because because the entire cosmos is an intelligent living energy, we we're, we exist. 
are now are the byproduct of uh, the creation of a very mature soul, a very mature soul that has literally, my analogy is like a, a tree. When mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's mature, it, it blooms and it goes, it drops a bunch of seeds. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's what our universe was. It it it, it developed from a seed, a, a, a seed of light, which we could call a soul. It developed, it bloomed, call it the Big Bang. I think of it more as a big bloom. But it, it when it bloomed, it matured, and it went to seed. It, it literally seeded this entire universe that it created, and, and we're all part of that. And I mean, literally, according to science, we're all connected on some level energetically. It's called entanglement. Yeah, quantum and yeah, quantum entanglement. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, for anybody who's interested, just look up Bell's theorem, and you'll exactly. get more detail. Yeah, great okay. stuff. The, it's important because not only are we all related, but we really are all connected, and that's where the the things about telepathy and empathy, uh, or empathic type of uh, you know action at a distance, and information exchanges and stuff. I mean, uh, it, it supersedes anything that we can do with technology. Uh, I was shown that actually during my contact up there in the mountains in Malibu was uh, that that we're all connected through this web of light. Yes. Yes. Okay. And um, uh, and that's permanent. That that is permanent unless we choose to disconnect ourselves, and that's unfortunate because that's what a lot of us here have been uh, persuaded or dissuaded into believing. You know, I mean, in other words, believing the lie, and so we just literally disconnect uh, by our own volition at some point and. Now we're stuck in the matrix, and, which is a completely false construct. And it's what, it, what that's doing is um, uh, stifling our potential as seeds of light here in this garden. And um, it's yeah, this, also... This matrix, is, is, it's actually an artificial construct it that is. we're rooted into. <laughs> yeah, it's completely artificial. And we were never designed to live like this. You know? And as I said, it truly is foreign or alien. Um, the movie, The Matrix, uh, is, you know, it, it's a, a good metaphor. Yes. Uh, yeah. They're not machines, but they're machine-like. You were asking about their intelligence. They're intelligent enough to know how to survive like any other hive-like, uh, you know, insect or parasite. They do – look, I mean, even plants communicate. You just uh, hit right? on an important concept there, the idea of the hive mind. Yeah. Um, and I, and I think that's so repugnant to us as humans right now because we consider ourselves to be um, each of us independent consciousness, which we are. And yet, as you just pointed out, um, we also are intimately connected to each other. There's all these weird par paradoxes that go into all these concepts. But the idea of the hive mind seems to come up and it came up for me. I've been researching UFOs and extraterrestrial phenomena since I was a kid, mainly because of the experiences that I had when I was young, and it continued for a long time. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, I was very interested in the nature of these beings. And one of the things that I discovered probably back, this was late discovery, was the work of a man named Nigel Kerner, who wrote a book called Gray Aliens and the Harvesting of Souls. Yes, I know Nigel. And uh, I did, I've done like six hours of interviews with Nigel <laughs> and his associates. And you yeah. know that Nigel can really pour the information out. Yep. But Nigel hit on some key concepts that I thought were important to understanding the archons. The grays appear to me to be some kind of machine-like hive mind species but yep. they appear to not be autonomous, but to be some sort of uh, automaton creation of a higher intelligence. Right. Yeah, they're just drones or... Uh, yeah. That's, yeah, android of some sort. Um, and, the, yeah, they do collectively work off of a, a network, I guess you'd say. Um, it's, it's hard for me to say for sure because I don't really spend a lot of time dealing with them um i'm more focused on the benevolent ones i know that the grays exist and that they're that they're just an extension of this archon uh matrix right but they're not the only ones i mean there yeah. there are there's human beings that are part they're absolutely part of it. like agents in the member of the movie anybody right. could become an agent and that's unfortunate but it's true, especially if you go to washington dc you're walking right into uh, uh, you know, ritual magic. Uh, the the Beltway is actually a um, 
a uh, place where, you know, if you want to look at it in religious terms, that was designed to literally bind Satan to that location. Yeah, it's a circuit. It, yes, very much so. For, but for the, it's a circuit that taps into this really negative, dark energy that they need in order to sustain themselves. Well, and, then, and, and then you look at the, the, the giant obelisk in the reflecting pool that sits there in the center of D.C. Yep. You, 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 you look at the, the similar edifice that exists in, Va- in the Vatican. I mean, I've got one yep. across the river from me in the capital city of Pennsylvania. <laughs> the same thing. And you yeah. start seeing these structures, and this will get us back later on, these megalithic structures that seem to serve no purpose except to energize some sort of transfer of, of energy. And I know Washington, D.C., Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, is a microcosm of Washington. It is a replica mm. of Washington on a micro scale. Mm-hmm. And the energetics of the city itself completely parallel it. Well, I mean... Rome was the blueprint for mm-hmm. Washington exactly. D.C. and wherever the Romans go, they they build these uh, replica of their original Capitolium that sat on one of the seven hills of Rome. Right, it was the place where the senators would go and have council with their one Lord, true God, Jove. Okay, Jove was later cast out, and they they transferred him into Jehovah when they turned into a, the Christian. Right, uh, yeah, which was you know, Yahweh, Catholic. basically. Right, but the name Jove literally yeah. was served them up until the time that it was. I mean, he was the head of the Lord, overlord of all the other gods, so he was the one, and he was always depicted as a man. Um, and um, uh, but like I said, they all they did was convert him into from Jove to Jehovah. So mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. but it's the same thing. They were they they would go in there and and seek his. His uh, council, as it were, which is weird because if it was just a statue, a stone statue, how is that going to give them any advice whatsoever on how to run an empire? Doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? I mean, there's something more to that story that we're not getting. But anyway, um, uh, the Capitol building in, in Washington D.C. is is a replica of the Capitolium, and um, it originally it wasn't called D.C. It was called New Rome, and um, and, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of things that I dug up for the, the second book that were just shocking to me. Um, I actually almost – I really didn't want to publish the second book. But, it, again, a lot of things I've, I didn't really want to do. You didn't really do even it. want to know this stuff after you no, got done with it. Uh, no, I didn't. But I, well, I sure – you know, the other thing is I didn't want to be a target. I didn't want to be the one who was bringing this information out. Um, but, you know, I it, the thing – I guess the thing I realized was I don't really have the luxury of um, – denying the information a, uh, a conduit because people do need to realize these things even though it's being denied uh, by the powers that be um, uh, th- it's important that people do recognize the the, uh, the timeline the arc of how we got here into this mess and um, you know the archons are not all powerful they that's why they do things covertly that's why they manipulate others covertly that's why they um, twist the truth around and are constantly, you know, denying things that are absolutely true. And um, because they know that at some point, if enough people wake up and recognize that they exist, that that the archons really do exist and that they are manipulating us, once we reach a tipping point where there's enough people that say, whoa, that explains it. Now I see why people do what they do. Um, then it's the beginning of the end for them um, because, uh, you know, the, the human spirit is such that it, because of free will, we do not want to be, we don't, we're not comfortable being puppets uh, or ser- slaves. Uh, we were never designed to do that. And so um, part of us, like in the movie The Matrix, we want to break free and um, continue our path, you know, as seeds of life, souls, you know. Uh, so this this information has been um, suppressed for a long time. That's why the Gnostics were utterly annihilated. Anybody who had any yes, Gnostic, exactly. any group that picked up the Gnostic or Hermetic teachings along the way through history has been utterly decimated. The Cathars, the, um, yes. uh, the Albigenses, I guess they were called. That's right. Um, numbers of groups where the, the Crusades were actually in the beginning nothing more than a search and destroy mission 
for yeah. what they were calling the heretics, which were right. the preservers of this knowledge. The, the original Christians. Exactly, yes. You know, who saw Christ as an avatar. Yes. Who was not a physical being. He was one of the benevolents that had volunteered to come here in the midst of a hostile territory and uh, sort of take po point. Yes, you know? exactly. That's... <laughs> and look, the, the, even though they, they completely twisted his, his ministry and work here uh, after the fact, a lot of what uh, the, the essence of what he was set out to do actually did survive in, in this regard. By demonstrating forgiveness in the face of utter, utter uh, torture, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, the worst, worst violations you can imagine as he was being crucified, um, he was forgiving them. And by demonstrating that ability, he set something in motion in people. Um, that that with if it hadn't happened like that, uh, we would probably be in a much darker place than we're at right now. So yeah, that act, that spirit has carried down through history, and it's you know Robert years. I spent a lot of years in Christianity, and I was on radio um, early in two thousand for about five years when I began to have doubts and ask a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. One of the questions that I ask, and I'm like you, you know, I ask questions and eventually I'm led to look at something, go somewhere, talk to somebody like we're talking tonight. Mm -hmm. But I at one point ask, how is it that they so completely altered the story of this <laughs> person who walked the planet, but they yeah. didn't just wipe it out altogether? And the answer that I got back was they required a significant amount of that story in order to contain the main truth. Mm -hmm. In other words, they could allow that to live as long as nobody ever asked the questions about who was the enemy. When we focused <laughs> on on this Messiah being and we, we generalized everything, we never had a sense of our enemy because the Old Testament had been expunged as well. True. And so all of these... All these old books, including the Quran, by the way, and, and, and I interviewed um, last year an Islamic man um, about the jinn, and he, we did a good show. Mm -hmm. But we've all had our memory banks wiped and we've had our histories altered that we do not know enough about these beings. True, true. Well, so, okay, so as you probably know, most people in the Christian community and certainly outside it, are painfully unaware of the alleged event that happened just before the crucifixion or just, I mean, and that's when he went up on the, on a mount mm -hmm. or a mountain with a few of his disciples and he literally began to glow in the dark. The transfiguration. Yeah. 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 Most people overlook that. And what really floored me a few years ago when I started looking at it, I mentioned it to a, a native American shaman. I become friends with out here in new England. He's like, Oh, you didn't know. Because, <laughs> and he says, he says, yeah, you know, that's you should. I'm surprised you didn't know that. I said that he said that's very similar to what happened to you. I'm like, okay, uh, I don't know how to, I don't know how to, <laughs> where to, what I can do with that. But thanks for telling me about. It. I mean, he he just was acting like it was no big deal. Like, you know, why why are you acting surprised? And and so the more I looked into it, I realized that it wasn't the first time. Supposedly when he was baptized. Uh, Here's an was... interesting side detail to that. I Go just ahead. learned this uh, in the last few months. I've been reading some esoteric texts that were entrusted to me by uh, a teacher who passed on. Mm. The John the Baptist stated that he was unworthy to even unlatch the sandals of Jesus the Christ. Mm -hmm. I've now learned that the unlatching of the sandals is, in fact, a um, an esoteric metaphor for mm -hmm. what we've been talking about, the transfiguration, your own enlightenment experience. It is mm -hmm. literally the unlatching of the feet anchoring to the earth <laughs> and the elevation <laughs> of the spiritual estate. R releasing and one's releasing, soul. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Well, you know, here's the other thing. God, I got just got a huge chill when I <laughs> you're talking to me about this. Um, I shared I, I that mean, chill, up, by up the way. When I, yeah. So it, it no. Um, okay. So that was 1985. In 1975, I was in Egypt. I was 15, 
and uh, I, I, my parents, we, it was, I'd been traveling for two years with my parents, um, off and on to over 50 countries when I was a teenager. Wow. And yeah, it was just what, again, one of those things. And, um, but the final trip, and we, we, we always went on these, on these cruise ships, uh, my parents were working and I sort of helped them and it was, it was really quite an adventure, but the bottom line is this, I'm only 15 and I find myself going inside the Great Pyramid by myself because uh, my parents said, no, we don't want to go in there. I'm okay. I'm gone, you know. And I went in there and I spent some time alone in the Queen's Chamber, so-called. Mm-hmm. And then I, I ascended the Grand Gallery and uh, I got to the, the those massive stone locks before you get into the so-called King's Chamber. And I was looking at that, and then I, I realized there was a bunch of people in there. They were part of a tour group. and But I decided I would go in there anyway just to have a look around. And um, I was in there for, I don't know, very, very short time. I walked in. I was in the back of the room with all these people and uh, a, a local guide wearing a white robe and some sort of head ge- thing. He struck that stone box with a wooden mallet. And it rang like a tuning fork. Mm-hmm. And I I could literally hear and feel the energy of it r- moving around the room in a spiral, which I believe they call that the golden mean. You're right. In in a rectangle, when you do that, it's it's it does this weird spiraling thing. Anyway, it's some some geometric thing about creation. Anyway. It's called well, that's actually the the box itself is rectangular or square, and so but the, the waveform itself is is, is circumferen- circumferential. It's like, it's like a nautilus. Yeah, it's called circling the square. It's ah. that's actually an ancient ritual as well. Yeah, it is. It is. It is. And but okay, so <laughs> the geometry of it blew my mind because I I, I was um, my mom was a, a concert pianist, so I did a lot of okay. Uh, did, I, I knew you what? recognized the tonal. Oh, I, I mean, yeah, because I'd, I'd played violin and orchestra okay, for great. a few years. So yeah. I, mean, I, was, I was really listening intently to this thing and feeling it. And the next thing I know, my vision went completely white. Mm-hmm. And, and my hearing was, I heard this like, I heard, it was, it's like it was passing out. It was weird, but I was completely awake. And like, I, it was like I got this hissing noise in my ears and I completely, my vision went white. And the next thing I know, I'm, I, it felt like I was standing outside the pyramid, uh, which I'm like, what? what? I mean, I, I wasn't expecting any of this. I was not expecting it at all. And, and I wasn't there very long, but I felt like – now, understand, I was within a room of people. But when I was outside the pyramid, I felt right. like there was other beings out there, but they didn't seem human to me. And and I'm looking at the pyramid. I'm looking at them. And the next thing I know, I'm back in the pyramid. And the sound is now like dissipating, almost like it's going down a drain, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And I I'm looking around at these people, and I'm thinking, did they? Did everybody just see that? You know, I I really had no idea, you know. And so as they started filing out, I went over to the guide, and I was trying to ask him why did why did you do that? What was that all about? You know, I thought maybe he knew. That you know that if you, if you hit this, everybody goes you know out of the pyramid and back in. Is like what the? And he looked at me. He's like, he, <laughs> I know he spoke English, but <laughs> he thought he probably thought I was nuts, you know, because I was. I think I was a little incoherent at that time. I was really stunned. And um, the reason I bring that up is because if you fast forward ten years later, what was it that I was doing? Was uh, uh, the frequencies that I was generating in my body through the earth at the top of a, 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 a mountain, which, right. okay, is a pyramid. I mean, that's where I was. I was in the um, at the upper third of the apex of the pyramid. It's an artificial mountain, and clearly energy is focused in that like a lens. And so especially in the chambers, those relief chambers, they call them relief chambers, and they are, but the energy passes through there and then feeds back. I mean, I see, that was the thing when he struck that – Thing. It, it not only was it spiraling, it actually got louder. It got louder. He just hit it once, and it, it normally you hit a tuning fork and it just kind of goes out. 
Right. It, it just fades out. But no. what did you do when you were on top of the rock and you were doing when you were doing the aum? You placed your tongue up against mm. the palate of your mouth, which created a resonance chamber inside yeah. your mouth against it, it, the bone. No, not only that. Just above that, if you look at a at a uh, diagram of the human head, it's a chamber. It is. It's a hollow place yeah. called the cave of Brahma. Exactly. It, the the, mm. the a doctor would call it a corpus callosum. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but it yeah. is it is a hollow place. And so, of course, the resonance is going to build in there, right there. Um, there was a book by a guy named Chris Thomas, and I believe that was his name. He wrote a really interesting book about this, and he said that that's where actually where reality, our reality is there. That's where we see everything, that we create a hologram in there. I know who uh, this guy is, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it was this was years ago. You know, see, the thing is, when I came down off the mountain that back in September, it would have been September 22nd, actually, when I came down. But, and you know, it, if you look in history, that's, that is a very auspicious day. A, a lot of times, uh, very trans transformative things do yeah. happen, either intentionally or unintentionally on that day to different people. Throughout time, including um, uh, the guy who was the um, who was the guy with the did the uh, sorry I'm blanking out here the uh, Mormon um, Joseph Smith. Thank you. He had he had that encounter with the so-called mm -hmm. angel Moroni right. Moroni. on that yeah. date, and who led him to those artifacts, uh, which later became supposedly translated, etc. So uh, that's just one example. And by the way, I'm not trying to start a religion, okay? But it just, it was very, I was struck by the some of the similarities of this glowing being coming into his room and communicating with him. Uh, but anyway, the, um, the there's something about uh, these, these higher energies when we, when we connect with them that increases, oh, okay, it, what it does is it connects us to the cosmos, or I should say reconnects us. We're all, it, it seems supernatural to us at the time, but in fact, it's really our natural state. Um, well, it's the formative state. Um, yeah. If you go and you look at, and, and you know, I, even though I know the Bible was altered, I don't walk away from what's actually in there. Right. But in the beginning, it says in the Gospel of John was the Word, and the Word, the Word was God. Well, the Word is Logos, and it is yeah. the formative initiatory vibration yeah. Of creation. Yep. Yeah. And that's and that is the thing. It when a soul becomes mature enough to create an entire universe, it part of the thought process is it says, I am that I am. Mm -hmm. it, it, it becomes uh, what they call self-realized, self-existent, self self-realized. Yes, because uh, yes, <laughs> Uh Yes. Okay. Because our thoughts define us. Because thoughts, energy. Look, this, this is the other thing that came. It, it's so much when I came off the mountain. It was like the beginning of a, a whole new life in a lot of ways. Uh, as far as I was interested in certain things, but suddenly I found that there was uh, stuff just kept coming at me. It's like a binary download, wasn't it? Yeah. You know, I still don't know everything that happened while I was there. Like no. I said, I suspect I, I was. I, I know. I would assume that I wanted to visit when I was in that other state. I, I really feel like I went to visit that boy. And that's how I knew that there were scars on his soul from these things convincing him that he was somehow something other than what he really was, mm -hmm. you know, a being of light. They had literally infested his thinking to the point where it was starting to scar his soul imprint. Because, and here's, here's how I, I kind of know that to be scientifically is over the years, it's a, um, Somebody gave me a book, a series about uh, digital physics. It's sort of that's what they're calling it, but it's uh, what it states is that consciousness is primary, and that um, to summarize, consciousness can take th three phase states. Like a drop of water can be a solid, a liquid, or a gas. Right, right. Consciousness can be pure consciousness, energy, or matter, depending on its vibratory state. Um, and it's, but it's the thing is why it's, this is important is it's all self-referential. Okay. It, it's, it, it can't really fully separate from itself. It can, however, like I said, if, if a person chooses to believe a lie or accept a lie that they're not part of all this and they want, you know, they want to go down that path and explore it. Well, that's, that's what hell is in my opinion. Uh, it's, it's a state of mind 
And that's not a trivial thing, by the way. It's not just rattling around in the, the gray matter of your brain. It's it's resonating. These thoughts are frequencies. I mean, look, nothing in this world comes into being without having uh, existed as a thought. And, when, and I'm talking about man-made, right? right? Everything, everything that's physical starts off as a concept. And a concept, a thought, is not a physical thing, and yet it's interconnected to the physical world, right? And exactly. that's, where, yeah. that's where these things cross the boundary. That's, that's when you were asking me about their intelligence and their abilities. It, they don't have to be physical. They don't need to be as long as they can manipulate our thought process. If they can go into our minds, like they say the jinn says, they, they can whisper into a man's soul, yeah. that, that is not a good thing. That cannot be a good thing. By any stretch of the imagination, that is that is unholy. Well, that is almost the definition of schizophrenia clinically. Um, yeah, and that's why someone who works in this field actually contacted me when they heard. Yeah, me let's talk about, about that for a minute because this Go is ahead. a good data point. Um, yeah, you I, and I don't remember the name he used, but I listened to that interview. Doctor J. Yeah, Doctor J. J. That's not yeah. his name. Now this is a man who has he's he's a clinical psychologist. He's working in mental institutions, uh, psych wards, and yep. prisons where you have people that I guess you would call criminally insane. And yeah. as a result of his experiences, and I think, you know, truthfully hearing his interview, he was also being led intuitively. Yeah. He began to correlate that, that psychiatry, which has profiled this type of behavior and classed it as being of uh, different orders, has also consistently treated it using psychoactive drugs. And I, and I, and I believe, yeah. look, one more tangent here. You and I have both interviewed Steve Richards of Holographic Kinetics. Yeah, yeah. And you and I both know, I, I've done three interviews with Steve, and one of the things that we talked about extensively was the impact of using psychoactive drugs on uh -huh. people already exhibiting bipolar or... Um, schizophrenic behavior patterns and yeah. so here's a here's a here's a man who i think is a great man just for being frankly having the stones to come out and say what he said and risking <laughs> his reputation yeah but also the insights that you glean from an interview with somebody like that who's boots on the ground dealing with what is frankly the uh spiritual septic tank of humanity right now mm -hmm. so you gain you gained in that uh basically a whistleblower right inside the system. Well, he was asking for my help, by the way, uh, because he figured I could, because I've, yeah, uh, become a, a spokesperson mm -hmm. for this. I, again, I was never planning this, um, but, you know, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so whatever. It, it is what it is. And yeah. he, he, he wanted me to help him write a book, and I agreed at first, and boy, wow, was I surprised at how vicious the attacks became uh, against me um, energetically. They were going just all out to stop me from uh, working with Dr. J. And at some point I had to say, hey, I can't, I can't do this. I'm physically, every time I sit down here at the computer, I, I'm, I, f I feel like, you know. You're being I mean, just, drained. Not just drained. I feel like somebody's putting electrical shocks into, uh -huh. my, into my teeth. Uh-huh. You know, and and he knew exactly. He that's one of the things he'd seen exhibited to him as a demonstration that these things literally can, uh, on a limited scale, uh, create a, a affect our reality. You know, with like some kind of very weird electrical intelligence. So uh, so they can affect computers. They can affect our nervous system. And um, certainly, the pain was excruciating. I went to the dentist, and he says, "You're fine." He says you're fine, but in he, the, the the upshot of all this, he goes, you don't have any uh, bacterial thing going on. You're you know right. physically, mechanically, everything's intact. He goes, but next time you feel that electricity, call me. And I went, I didn't say electricity. What is he talking about? And then it started to dawn on me. Then I I really started looking into my mouth, and I found that I had like um, sores in there. And I thought, wait a minute. So I went to a doctor, ear, nose, and throat guys. He goes, oh, you got a virus. Uh, uh, really? I got a virus. He goes, uh, I said, what kind? He goes, I don't know. Well, what are you going to do about it? Nothing. What? <laughs> oh, oh, slow down here. Uh, no, I can't live like this. You know? And he says, well, I, I, there's nothing I can give you. 
and I walked out and I go, okay, this is, this is really funny guys. You know, um, I'm not going to just let you do this to me. Um, and if you think you're going to you stop me, you're absolutely hundred percent wrong. And so I started, I, once I realized it was a virus that they put in me, um, which is an art that is an artificial construct that they, they can create sort of like genetic manipulation. See, they can't create genes, but they can manipulate them. <laughs> Got it. So, yeah. And right. that's what viruses do, man. That's all they're designed to do is, is do genetic manipulation to their, for their advantage, not ours. So I remembered, oh, yes, there are Amazon botanicals that I can take that, that are known to eradicate viruses. Started doing that, and I was like, uh, I had a very powerful LED light, and I started shining it in my mouth. You're not going to believe this, but the, the viruses literally retreated out of my mouth and went down further into my esophagus, and it, which was, it was so painful, but at least the, the, my, my teeth didn't feel like they were right. being, you know, electrocuted. But I mean, it, the, it, it was just the most insane thing, you know. Um, if I didn't know what was going on, it would have really, really done a, uh, some, a number on me. But the, the truth of the matter is I kept working. I'm in constant contact with Dr. J, and actually people all over the planet have been uh, contacting me, at, mainly just as a, a thanking me and also offering their um, uh, confirmation that, you know, this is real because, hey, they're saying I've experienced it too and yeah. wanting to share. Uh, so that's that's why I say no. I've know, experienced it too, and, and I've I, experienced I'm, it within the last five or six years. I am not surprised, and because, like I said, this thing is either real or it's not. And I, I I would not have ever come out publicly unless I I was convinced that it was real, and furthermore that I could prove it. And um, uh, the reason <laughs> that it's coming up right now is because we have entered into. Uh, uh, a place that NASA calls the fluff. And in fact, it is, some people in esoteric circles call it the photon zone or the photon band. Right. It, it's a giant charged uh, cloud of charged particles. In other words, again, it's it's an energy field. And if you remember what I said, energy is consciousness. And so there's an intelligence here, a higher intelligence that we have literally become embedded in. Us meaning our solar system, which is actually a bubble of energy called a heliosphere. Right. Okay, so it is now completely immersed in this massive cloud of charged particles, energy, that NASA doesn't want to tell people about, but it's out there if you look for it. And um, it's they say it's going to take at least 200 years for us to transit through it. So this is, strategically, this is a, a very important time for the benevolent ones, of the beings of light, to come in here and start cleaning things up, because it's very, it, it's the reason. The reason also I'm telling you this is because this is why the beings, the archons, and all the ones that they manipulate, they are acting out of desperation. They know that they feel that they're slipping their grip, and that's why they're they're uh, doing these these just. I mean, I think they're they're getting worse, not better. Okay, they're acting really really desperate. Well, let's just look for a minute at their human, we'll call them that, and we'll give them the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. They're, they're human foot soldiers on the ground right now, you know, yeah. what people euphemistically call the New World Order, the Cabal, or the Illuminati. Right. And if you look at the world right now and you look at what's going on, I mean, look, we got an economic system that is based on nothing. It is tanking. We have a, a, a complete... Um, fracturing of political alliances. I mean, did you really think we li we grew up at least in what you would call the post Cold War years? Did you yeah. ever really think you would live to see Russia looking like the good guys on the planet? <laughs> well, the Chinese. I mean, see, everything everything is inverting. Everything is stepping up, and they are growing increasingly desperate. These false yeah. flags that they've yeah. been pulling off since uh, two thousand one have become incredibly intrusive and violent. You see, uh, you can start with uh, the mass shooters, Georgia Tech. That's where yeah. I started tracking all this. I mean, I go back to the JFK assassination. Oh, yeah. So you have all these dark moves that are being made by the cabal who are acting whether they know it or not. And I don't think, I think at the high levels they do, at the low levels yes. they don't understand Correct. that they are 
they are basically the foot soldiers of, they're pawns. of these beings. Yeah, they're pawns. But you're right. The people at the top, the so-called elite, they're pawns also, but they, they're willing pawns. They've yes, sold out. They, exactly. They, exactly. That's what Dr. J said. They, they, yeah. Some people actually have a relationship where they, they, they know they're getting something out of it, so they just keep doing it. They, they've sold out. But here's, in summary, this is totally unsustainable. It was never, they, like, it's totally alien, foreign. And the other thing is the the part of the problem here is because they want to keep us divided against ourselves, that's the other reason it's unsustainable. It's utterly unstable, okay, to have a house divided. It, it can't stand. So you see civilizations are constantly rising and falling, and, and uh, it's, it's like the body is sort of uh, tearing itself apart because it has no stability whatsoever because it was based on a, a, a you know, uh, false foundation, yeah. right? Of of this manipulative archonic matrix, and it's um, uh, it's just a matter of time before before the. I, I know people don't like it when I say this, but there is going to be an intervention. However, the caveat to that is my understanding about all of this because I've been asked to see, you know, how I was very curious. How does this get resolved? Is it possible? You know, I mean, I really didn't know. And um, I figured because I am speaking about this, I would, I mean, I should, I think I have a responsibility to uh, help people see the, what's coming, if that's even possible. So, I again, just like I asked before about clarity, I also asked about how does this conflict get resolved, Right. if, if it can be resolved. And the answer was quite surprising to me, but it made a lot of sense, which is, um, all these things will be revealed to everyone in in full. And what we call that, disclosure. You, you might call it that, but yeah. it won't just be about extraterrestrials. Right. It will literally be the archons and everything. All the cards are going to be on the table at some point here, I believe, no later than 2020. Um, at that time, because we are beings of free will, uh People are going to have to make a decision whether or not they want to continue to be pawns of the archons or do they want to uh, return to um, their natural state as a being of light in a, in, a, in a universe of light beings. In other words, reconnect with our, our true family. And step out of the matrix. You know, that was the end of the movie, right? I watched it again last night. Yeah. Um, that was yeah. the whole upshot of that whole thing. The uh, the Oracle wanted to do all of that was really to wake up more people and give them the opportunity to step out. I think that's also why that movie has become such an effective metaphor. I mean, that movie yeah. came out, what, 1999 or something? Right. And yet look at how it is now. I mean, a, a five-year-old understand. well, maybe not a five-year-old, but most people in the culture understand the matrix metaphorically as meaning yeah. quote this prison planet or this this false concept reality that we're embedded in well yeah but i mean the biggest metaphor for me was that um we are we're not their battery but we are their energy source see that there's a distinction there because they, sure. they're not machines but they need that negative energy in order to survive here and they can't get it unless they uh, manipulate us to, to do harm to ourselves or others or both and that's why we see uh, so much every day in our face violence uh, and, and anger and confusion. They, they thrive off of that because we literally are feeding them uh, what they need. And so, you know, like I said, that's, that's also why, though, they can't be overt or truthful or honest about who they are, why they're here, and what's our role. Uh, you remember in The Matrix, the architect said to Neo at one point, he says, you know, there's been many different variations of the, of the Matrix. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he says, well, there was one where we actually let everybody know what was going on. And they just wouldn't, they didn't produce. It was like a, a passive aggressive. They just, <laughs> yeah, they just yeah. refused. They just said, screw this, you know. Well, I, and I think that's true because, <laughs> look, we don't really... We live in such limited lifespans. We don't understand how vast um, time has been in terms yeah. of even human existence in this present dimension or how many times we've been through this. Because I tend to believe 
that we're kind of like caught in time loops sometimes. Where yeah. and this is something Steve Richards talks about. Mm-hmm. Um, we're basically a, 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 a particular moment, uh, what you would call an inception, is created, which then begins to loop back on itself. And the only way that you can effectively change things is to change a key element inside the game, which is what this really is on a cosmic level. Mm. Well, like I said, I I do feel it's an anomaly, and it was utterly not part of the creation of this original universe. Uh, I mean, we call it our, our home. Our origins are here. That's what I mean by original. It is not the only universe. Universes are um, being born all the time. Sure. I, there, I, I personally feel like there is no limit to the amount of universes that can be created because it's just like a computer. You just keep adding more memory. And so, therefore, you can write more programs. You can create more files. It's just, I mean, it really is. When I said digital physics, I meant that um, a digit of consciousness is either on or off, but it's, it's, it still exists. It has, it has potential. Well, it's one state or another, yeah. Yeah, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Just because it's off right, doesn't mean right. it doesn't exist. Okay, so that's this is <laughs> this is the thing. We have an unlimited amount of potential, but it's being uh, denied us by these these uh, archon, these parasites. I mean, look, we know for a fact that parasites affect all living systems uh, negatively. Mm-hmm. This world was never designed that way. It, when you talk about short lifespans, we were never designed to live such a short lifespan. No, when not this at world all. was still in, when it was still intact, our ancestors were much larger, smarter, healthier. They lived a lot much longer, relatively speaking. They lived a natural, normal lifespan of you know a thousand years or more. That's not unheard of at all. I mean, uh, the body can regenerate itself, and it does so naturally. Unless it's being bombarded with all kinds of, uh, you know, toxic crap. Oh, that look at the world right now. I uh, GMOs, <laughs> the, the chemtrailing that's going on. And everything, everything in our ecosystem has been by human facility altered in some way. So that I yes. mean, I go through this all the time trying to even figure out what to eat anymore. Yeah, um, or breathe, or, or drink. Breathe. You, yeah. you can't you, see, but this is the thing it, that you can say it's humans. But but if this is one of the great, great strategies that has served the archons really well mm-hmm. is convincing us that they don't exist. Therefore, we don't do anything about it. Look, if you don't if you don't know you have a problem, you're certainly gonna, not going to act to 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 solve it. And that's what they've done is convince enough of us that they don't exist, that the that the archon is not a parasitical infection and um, and that everything you see around you is just a random event. And there's no consciousness involved in it. It's just, you know, uh, business as usual. All right. People are flawed and we make mistakes. And, uh, you know, um, uh, we're all victims, essentially, in, in this in this narrative, this false narrative that we're living under in the matrix. Like I said, it's an artificial construct. It's the furthest thing from the truth that you could possibly imagine. Um, and, and that's why it was a hard, hard thing for me to uh, finally understand what the truth is. It took years, uh, and ultimately, it was like unlearning. It was, I think, the hardest part was unlearning so many of the lies that that we've been t- so-called taught or conditioned to. Uh, you know, we're literally programmed. We are programmed uh, from birth through vaccines and uh, other things that uh, you know, even religion. There especially, is some, well, especially religion. Especially, look, religion. you know, and you look at people and listen, <laughs> yeah. I was an ordained minister at one point in time. I understand the responsibility that you have as a spiritual leader. Mm. And in fact, that's what took me down the dark path was I realized that you can't be responsible for people spiritually if mm. you yourself don't know the truth and teach the truth. Well, and, and religion has hidden all this stuff. I mean, look, you know. This knowledge somehow or another was expunged, and yet it couldn't be escaped. They burned mm-hmm. the, the library at Alexandria. But isn't it odd? I don't know. Maybe you've never thought about this, but I've, I've, I've thought about this for years, Robert. Look what happened between 1945 and 1947, the mm-hmm. post-World War II period, the period when you begin to have heightened UFO activity, heightened... Yep. The post-nuclear age, when we when we've set off these 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 horrible bombs, 
and what appears uh, the Nag Hammadi manuscripts, and then in 1947, the Dead Sea Scrolls surface. It's almost like the Earth itself was holding these for a time when they were supposed to be revealed. It's not that simple, Randy. The, uh, the, the benevolent ones work behind the scenes. They are special forces here. Um, you can call them whatever you want, but, I mean, that's what they do. And it's a tough, tough assignment. They never take credit for what they do, uh, or rarely are they identified for the, uh, what they do. Um, but they certainly play a role in our path here. Um, and when they do come forward, if they're ever identified, people temp- typically deny it uh, because they're so conditioned uh. to only see the agents of, of the matrix. They only obey the archon. So when a being of light does appear, it is unwelcome. And discredited. That, they are discredited and as, as much as possible. And so because they, you know, and look, a lot of that happened to me, too. When I first came out with this story, uh, I got into a conflict and I um, exposed someone and it, it really turned ugly. And and um, there were people who um, tried, <laughs> tried to accuse me of things that are simply not true. And I realized in, in retrospect that um, all they're doing is keeping people who are in the dark from coming to the light. Uh, because that that's all I do. I'm just here to help people in that through that process uh, by sharing what I've learned. And um, I don't have an agenda unless you consider that an agenda is assisting my fellow mankind. I mean, um, uh, it, it, it just I'm just saying that they the 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 matrix knows how to defend itself, and it, and attacking somebody's character is is pretty simple. But it's not that effective. Just like I said, when they attacked me that day uh, on the beach, the un- un- unintended consequences was that it literally, like, uh, it was like uh, an egg hatching. You know, it was the pressure, that pressure of them doing yeah. that yeah. caused me to, uh, sort of like in the Matrix, you know, where he broke out of his little, uh, uh, that, that false embryo. Uh, that, yeah. they, that he was yeah. he was plugged into. I you know it 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 unplugged me. I was unplugged. But like I said, what was what was happening is I was unplugging. There was a whole other group there in the light that was there to assist uh, me and everybody else. That you know, like I said, we are not alone in this at all. Uh, that's one of the other big lies that we're just told. You know, oh God's out there. You know, the angels are out there. You know, the, it, it, if you have a contact with them, it's like, oh, that's that's rare. No, it's not. It's not. They're always here and they're always watching. And um, uh, they're just not welcome here because the um, the powers that be clearly are are opposed to any kind of liberation. Of, you know, here's the thing. They, my understanding is they look at us as their property. They captured this planet. They enslaved us. Basically, it's livestock. Yeah, and right, as Charles Fort said, you know, I think we're someone's property, or at least that's what it's that's looking exact, like. Yeah, it's a great quote. Okay, so, well, it's unfortunate, really, because it, it's not, not true, but as I said, what's happened over the e- eons here, a lot of souls have been recycled, and they the longer, this was the thing about the Gnostics, what they were so concerned about is that if you don't break free of the matrix at some point, you're going to think that's all there is Mm -hmm. and if you believe it you're going to that's what you'll live and and so that's why at this time that's exactly what you just described there is exactly what i was calling earlier the time loops the inception Mm -hmm. points Mm -hmm. because that's kind of the way it was displayed to me look our thoughts our thoughts yeah You, you know in physics you talk about the slit experiment you know where where you, the observer affects the outcome. Yeah, it's exactly. it's even more profound like than Schrodinger's that. Schrodinger's cat on a basic exactly. level. Yeah, exactly. But it's more complicated than that because our thoughts resonate out into the cosmos, which is an intelligent living energy. And when we when we send out these um, negative or uh, false false constructs of our thought processes going out, what we get back is confirmation of these things. Oh, that's, and we, that's, that's incredible. So there's the yeah. loop. There's the feedback yeah. mechanism. And so what it does is it, it like we go, oh, it is real. The, the lie is real, you see. And it's not. It's not. It's just, it's, just a, a, it's just feeding back on itself. 
and and it's so it, a lot of people have been caught in that trap, and that's another reason why, because we're all related. That's why these benevolent beings have put so much effort into coming into hostile territory and helping as much as possible w- without violating our free will. They are um, assisting us to break free and continue on our path, uh, in, you know, as, as beings of light. So do you know, can you give us details about the level or type of interventions that we can expect leading into um, that, that 2020 period? Yeah, you talk about false flags. Um, I hope I'm not giving things away that, that, that are going to alter the course here. No, I actually think the people that need to hear this will hear it and the rest of them won't. That's true. Okay, so it is, well, the way it was described to me was that the the extraterrestrials who are part of the Archon Matrix are going to as a as a final their 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 final trick that they're going to pull on us is to um, create this this disclosure mm-hmm. where and it's going to be headed up by mm-hmm. the UN. And of course, the, the Catholic Church has already sort of paved the way for that. Yes, they're they gonna, have. They're, they're yeah. going to be major players in all of this, uh, and they'll say, "Oh, you know, they've come to save us, and um, they're going to help us put up a, a space defense." And they're, by the way, they're also going to help because good old UN, you know, they've got their troops, uh, supposedly peacekeeping troops, right? Yeah, they're, they're going to enforce a. Uh, well, r- roughly a new world order where, you know, anybody, everybody has to come under this one umbrella. We're going to have peace, and if you don't have it, you will be shot. Well, or <laughs> uh, maybe neutralized, I think would be a better word, yeah. because they're going to be, they'll be they'll be bringing out the alien technology. Uh, so if you want to just erase somebody's mind and, and pacify them that way, sort of like a, a digital lobotomy, that, that's, that's going to be acceptable under the new world order i mean truly it'll be it'll it'll seem brand new but the, here's the here's the part about it it's the real you know like everything else they do it's a freaking lie uh they've been here all along and uh <laughs> i mean you look at my research in washington dc they're, they're they are there all the time and yet our government is saying nope they don't exist listen I, you know i don't know if, <laughs> do you know who um do you know who bob dean is of course he's an okay old uh bob dean told me in an interview that I did with him early on in this show that they literally walk the halls of the Pentagon. He said, I've seen them. I've sat on yep. planes with them. Yep. Okay. But so now those are just the humans that can walk among us. Right. There's all types of humanoids that are part of the Archon matrix that are, are here. Uh, so, well, some of them are covert agents. They're double agents and they're, they're doing what they can. I mean, those are on a physical level. Then you've got these other beings we would call angelic that are um, – they work in overtime to make things happen um, within certain parameters, okay? They do have rules and regulations they have to live by. But um, – so anyways, what I'm seeing is or what I've shown is that this whole uh, false flag thing about, oh, they're our saviors, they're here, they're out, you know, I mean, uh, it, when that happens – that's that's the beginning of the end. That is the beginning of the final days of the Matrix here. Uh, I suspect that there will be, as you might refer to biblically, as a separating of the wheat from the chaff. Yeah. Yep. And that a lot of us will literally be taken through portals to other worlds that are still pristine paradise worlds where we can continue our path as beings of light. The, the other beings here, the humans that are here, are going to um, – they will be evicted along with the the Archons. They're going to literally be just – I'm not sure exactly where they're going, but it, they're not welcome here anymore. They never really were. But you know, one of the things that I've kind of struggled with – I should just say real, real quick about this uh, – it seemed to me like if there's, you know, benevolent God and angels, why would they let all this suffering go on here for so long? And the answer I got, which was very shocking, but it made, again, it made a lot of sense, is that a thousand years to man is but a day, a day to God. To the God. Yeah. Okay. Or 
the gods, you know, the, the, the angelic hierarchy, they, because they're immortal beings, <laughs> this to them is, is, uh, they've been working on it. You know, they got on it right away. So they've been working on it, but because our, um, we look at things so differently, you know, there's a distortion there, uh, sort of like a Doppler effect. We just, we, we just process things differently. So they never abandoned us. They never just said, oh, we'll get around to that someday. You know, it was never like that. They've always been working. Again, most of it is behind the scenes. That's the only way they can do it. Uh, And timing is everything. And that's why I mentioned before, the fact that we are in this energetically charged area right now, it's, it's, it's sort of like the high ground for them. You know, it's, it is the time for them to, really do the final push. Um, if you know anything about a tipping point, if you ever study about tipping points, yeah. it's real interesting because it's to, to certain outside observers, they're like, oh, well, yeah, after the fact, they're like, yeah, everybody knows that. Well, what, what they, you don't see is all the leverage, all the energy and effort that went into uh, ach- getting to the tipping point. There's a, there's a lot that goes into actually achieving, but once you've gotten there, everybody on the other side of it, they're like, oh, that, yeah, sure, that's normal. That's, oh, we saw know. that coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like everybody's, yeah. you know, hindsight. hindsight's 2020. Yeah, sure. But <laughs> so, so anyway, this is a process. It's been going on for, relatively speaking, on Earth terms, it's been going on since the beginning of the fall. There was never any intention to let this go in the direction. I mean, it wasn't part of the plan. Okay. So what they had to do is come up with contingency plans to deal with this darkness that fell in this world that has entrapped so many souls here just to feed these damn parasites um, who don't even belong here. So anyway, like I said, at some point, though, I think the, the conflict resolution will come and it will simply be a utter 100 percent separating. There is no no longer blending, you know, the uh, the beings of light. What they said in the, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the sons of darkness and the sons of light. Right. You know, they yeah. won't be battling with each other anymore because um, they'll have what they want. In essence, you know, there's there are people who will willingly continue to be pawns of the Archons. They're just not going to be allowed to do it here anymore. And the other thing is the planet has been so badly damaged um, th- that everybody's got to get off of it. All the life forms have got to go because they're going to become extinct anyway. Uh, and that's that's not part of the plan. So there's other worlds that are easily accessible through these portals, and uh, the benevolent ones are going to they're going to uh, they're going to orchestrate this. Do you see, or have you been made aware that there will be an eventual refurbishing of the Earth? That the Earth itself. Yeah will be reclaimed, but that it requires a cleansing first. Yeah, but we're not going to be here for that. And there's, in fact, right. all, life, all life is going to be taken off because it's not their fault that it's gotten into such a degree. So you see state. a total planetary evacuation. Yeah, and uh, people are like, when I say that, they they really think I've lost my mind. But if you've read my article about the portal yeah. in the Pacific, that's one of many portals. They're in, see, this is the thing. The good guys are not going to show up in these massive spaceships and go, come on. You know, we're taking you to planet whatever. Uh, no, that's not how it's going to happen. That Those guys, that's the Archons. When they show up like that, they got the blessings of the UN and the, and the Vatican. Hell no. Nope. Those are, those are really the the beings that we, we we see on television that, you you know, that you get nightmares about. They've And they've always been, well, they've, in relative terms, they've been running the show here for like at least, 10,000 years now. You know, and, and the, the, the other side to that is that I've talked to, obviously, enormous amounts of people over the years. Yeah. And one of the commonalities of people that some of the people that I work with, in fact, is that we've all had these dreams of a place that feels like home, but it's not here. Mm-hmm. And it feels other dimensional. And yet at the same time, it feels oddly familiar. Uh, you just mentioned the, the, the island so mm. let people know about that story and where they can find that. Well, you'd have to go to my website at unicusmagazine.com. Oh, and, and they spoke. should. Yeah, thanks. Unicusmagazine.com. And go to articles. There's, It's right there. Um, uh, I don't know about that. There's no direct link. Just look at the, the megaliths of Malibu. 
uh, that uh, that'll that'll get you to the link for the. Uh, okay, specifically the. Um, I'll is put there a an link under- up with oh, okay. the show, so that'll cool. just make it easy. All right, that's that's true. Um, People will be able to download it's because the, the thing about it is uh, that that story does illustrate <laughs> something about how we can be yeah. so seamlessly moved into another um, another world, another reality. Yeah, and we're going to need a little help. When we get there, we won't be alone. There will be other beings there, humans and others, that will show us how to how to live again, you know, in the garden. And peacefully, no money, uh, no sickness, you know, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be a lot happier, okay? Everybody will be happier. There isn't going to be this constant negativity and, and divisiveness. And uh, it'll, it'll just feel like, home and we will treat each other everybody will treat each other like family again and um and it, it, it's our natural state is to live in a garden i'm not saying we can't have technology but honestly it's not well it's not serving us technology to, is a cheap uh, it's a crude uh, uh, simulation of things that we naturally can do i mean i yeah. look at i grew up with computers i'm comfortable mm-hmm. with them I also realize at this point that the internet, the interwebs, are a metaphor of connected consciousness. It's hopelessly yeah. flawed. It is a <laughs> terrible system, and it, we're using we're using toxic microwaves and Wi-Fi's and all of these um, yeah. low energy technologies to be able to communicate. But it is a metaphor for something that we naturally once had, I believe. Oh, and we'll have it again. Uh, like I said, the web of light is something. It was you, you kind of see this and de- depicted in the movie Avatar. Mm-hmm. How they yeah. they were all co- right. Yes. They're connected yes. to through the, through the planet. Um, and uh, you know, I, again, I wasn't looking for that story about the portal. It, it just it just <laughs> it it was literally just thrown into my lap. And I'm try I was trying to process like, well, well, okay, what does this mean? And I, boy, was I shocked when I realized that the the implication of all that was um, uh, the first time I saw a portal, a picture of a portal, was when I was doing the uh, the initial research on Washington D.C. There, the gentleman uh, Wilbur Allen at uh, UFODC.com, um, he he'd actually taken a picture inadvertently of of. A wormhole right there by the Capitol. Is this the guy that puts up cameras all the time and takes yeah. all these pictures and they break yep. his cameras? Okay. Yep. Well, they didn't just break it. They're doing uh, – <laughs> they're, it's it's an energy it, – that's fairly recent, by the way. Okay. They who, Somebody doesn't want him taking that stuff, and yet he keeps putting – he gets keeping – the cameras get repaired, and he puts them up there. Um, it, it's – it's uh, if you know anything about the Hutchison effect, that's the kind of energy okay. they're doing. It, they literally melt down a titanium uh, shutter. Oh. In in a Nikon camera with oh a titanium God. housing, yeah, it's it's that level so of technology. So he's using he's using pro grade Nikon's. He is a professional photographer. Okay. He was raised in a family where he had access to this. He's been a professional photographer for many years. Before I met him, before he actually got off on this, he was uh, he'd worked for ABC News as a technical engineer for about fourteen years at the White House and the Capitol building. Uh-huh. And so he knows cameras. He knows electronics. Uh, intimately, and he knows how to network them, and, and um, so. But you know, like I said, he, he's an interesting guy. If you ever read my books, uh, or specifically the first one, uh, "Close Encounters on Capitol Hill," I detail uh, how he was abducted as a child in a military family in uh, first in England and then again over here in America, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, living on base or just outside the base. He was the Grace abducted him and implanted him and his brother. His brother actually works for the Pentagon. Mm-hmm. Uh, Okay, and I don't know how many other people work at the Pentagon that are implanted, but I I would suspect it's more than a few. I would suspect that as well. Okay, so so like I said, my I wasn't you know this is this I keep saying this, but it's true. I wasn't looking for the story of Washington D.C. It came, found me, but I was the only one who who pursued it. And a lot of people are scared of it, and they would like to think that I just made it all up, and that's not true at all. Um, this is happening. Uh, Mr. Allen is not the only one who's taken these pictures. I have over a thousand eyewitness accounts from 1850 to the present of people who have seen these things 
many different walks of life uh, of you know individuals that are credible, sometimes airline pilots and others, police officers. Um, of course, like I said, the, la- the level of de- denial is something I always was puzzled about until I, I put the uh, demonic equation. I didn't call it Archon at that time. But when I as you know, as I was reading about the exorcist and there was this boy, right? There's this mm-hmm. young boy who's being doing things that don't make any sense. And he was hurting himself, he was freaking out his family, and then it correlated in my mind back to Malibu and I was like, Oh, oh my God, please no. This can't please tell me this is not what I think it is. And then I came to that awareness. It's like, no, it, it is. It really is. It's the same thing. And then, and that was like the 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 key. It, it it unlocked it, and it all put it into context. You know, or I should say, it was the beginning of really putting it into context. But I struggled and struggled and struggled until I asked for guidance on it. And then, you know, they they did. They they helped me. And I, and you know, the agreement I think I have served that served me well is that um i have access to this information as long as i agree to share it without censoring or using it to some personal agenda um uh it'll keep flowing you know and um uh i think i it started with a personal curiosity but it has now become i guess a profession but it's it's more than that it's a it's a mission it, hey, God, I wish you wouldn't use that term, but you're well, right. But it, it, and, I, and, I, and I know the words, you know, <laughs> escape us all, but why does anybody do what they do? Well, some of us are unconsciously very conscious about what it is we're doing. We become aware of what we're doing. Yeah, but here's the thing. I'm not here alone. I'm not the only one. And no. we're all in this together. I've always told people this is not about me. I talk about myself a lot. But it's only as a, uh, a touchstone, a way of um, humanizing the bigger picture. I'm using myself as an example of what has happened to mankind and what I've learned along the way. Hopefully, uh, if I share it well, um, it will it will assist those who want assistance to get out of this matrix and never have to return to this this false way of life. Well, that actually is why I'm having you on for this interview, and that's actually why I've been trying to sift through all of this information for, God, 30 years. Um, yeah. Because there has to be meaning in it. Otherwise, yeah. it's, it just becomes confusing, and we wind up going to sleep. I mean, the whole idea of soul sleep to me is simply when you become so overwhelmed that you shut down. Well, you have a choice. You can respond to things and recollect yourself and respond to the circumstances around you, or you simply can go numb and go into a state of spiritual catalepsy. And I, I see that around me so much now that I, I, I keep I'm, – I'm basically panning for gold at this point. <laughs> and, 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 you know, I've got it. I've got a great listener base. I have guests like you that come on that are really filling in the dots because no one of us has the whole picture, and no, no one of us can contain all this information. True enough, but in our current state, we have severe limitations placed on us. Yeah. In in our natural state, we can, we um, we can process a tremendous amount of information or energy uh, because that's just how we were designed. Especially when we're connected to. Think of it this way: you can find out just about anything through the internet these days. But if you're connected to the web of light, um, you can feel and know things at a distance all across the cosmos. So we're talking trillions of worlds and all these different intelligent life forms uh, are accessible to us. And all their wisdom, all their experience, all their compassion and love and insight is, is available to us. Now, that's pretty awesome, okay, without any kind of censorship whatsoever. Uh, as I said, you know, our potential is truly unlimited unless we choose to live in a, this, you know, a false construct. 
And so what you're doing is basically helping people to map the way right now. I mean, mm. in terms of awakening this consciousness. As we kind of close down the interview here, Robert, mm. um, what, what can the people do who hear this information, go to your website, and begin to put these pieces together? What 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 is the most critical thing that people can do right now with this information? Well, if, if someone you know is is of like mind you can share it with them if they haven't heard it before that's important but i think individually uh know that the time is coming you know that the time is short here for this matrix and i think it's important that we prepare this is why we're having this public discussion is is to uh see because people lack orientation and as things start to fall apart um it's going to cause a lot of confusion so Individuals who are awake and aware uh, have a responsibility to assist others, those who, who want assistance to, to make this transition. It'll be a lot more easier for everyone if we uh, reach out. And I, I don't mean like preaching to people. I mean just, you know, offering some assistance to them, help them to see the truth if they're struggling. And they're open to it because I, here's the thing. A lot of more, as people become more and more uncomfortable in the matrix, as it starts collapsing, uh, they're going to be open. They will be open yeah. to hearing the, 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 yeah. the, these, this information, the truth. They're, they're, they're going to be looking for answers, okay? And it's not coming from the government or, or the Vatican or, or the UN. It just isn't. So it's incumbent upon us to try and do that. That's why shows like this are so important. You know, the, the mainstream media is – not only is it a dinosaur, it's, it's toxic. It's toxic. And, and uh, so, you know, whatever truth you can share with other people very peacefully, you know, uh, and truthfully, um, you know, it, that's important. It really is. We, you know, I tell people we're a lot more important than we think we are, but not for the reasons, you know, the, the false reasons that people think, oh, I got money, I, you know, I got a house. or what? Those things are nothing. That's nothing. You know, that's that those are. Let's get back to the real quick. Remember that the the parable about the um, it's, it's easier for a rich man to, to pass the pass uh, camel heaven. to pass through the eye of a needle than a rich man to thank you move into the kingdom of heaven. Yes, right. Okay, because the camel has to ba kneel down on his knees. It's metaphorically we're talking about yeah. a, a doorway, mm -hmm. a doorway to the mm -hmm. city, the kingdom. Let's just call it the kingdom. The camel has to get down on his knees and take everything off of his back before he can get through that that portal and that's sort of a metaphor for who we are uh, we have we're carrying all this crap that is just totally insignificant and and a, sort of a burden that we don't even need in order to get through the doorway because honestly everything's going to be provided okay everything we need to live a healthy life a very loving happy peaceful life is is there on the other side of the portal or these portals to two worlds that are essentially paradise or gardens. That's what, that's what the word means. This Persian word means a, a, a walled garden mm -hmm. or biosphere. Mm -hmm. That's all, all we're talking about is returning to our natural state. And a lot of this, I think when people begin to do the research and we're going to do more shows on this as well, mm -hmm. we'll begin to see that the picture that you're painting is not as unrealistic or as, I guess you would call it airy fairy as, as they might think it is right now that um, basically we're sitting at the end of an age and uh, we have decisions to make about our short, short term and our long term position. Right, right, right. I think it's a good place to leave it for this interview. Robert Stanley, thank you for coming on to Off Planet Radio and for sharing this information with this audience and with the greater audience that are out there. I know you 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 have you're busy and you you're doing a lot of work right now and uh, anything we can do to help you, let us know and and stay in touch with us. Will do, Randy. Thanks for having Very me. Very good. That's been off plan. This has been off planet radio. My guest Robert Stanley. We'll be back with another show very soon. The truth is out there. It's inside you.